Welcome to KURE Sports on ISU TV. I'm Taylor Mankel, welcomed by Michael Mainzer and Matt Barker here for episode five. Made it all the way to five episodes. Pretty impressive, if I do say so myself. So we've got a lot to talk about. Let's jump into it first with the season that just concluded in very exciting fashion, that be it. Villanova versus North Carolina in the national championship. First question I want to ask you guys, did you have Villanova against North Carolina in the national championship at any point in this season? Uh, I did not, and I know we mentioned Nova a little while back and didn't give enough respect to the Big East, yeah. but Villanova had a very tough road going all the way to the end and just beating Kansas, Oklahoma, North Carolina. Those were commonly uh, used as like the number one picks, and mm -hmm. Villanova just was so impressive with their shooting. and in so many different ways. They were. So, Barker, did you ever have Villanova? Even when it was down to the Final nah. Four, did you ever have Villanova UNC? Nah. Uh, I just, I thought that they they played, like you said, Oklahoma, Kansas, and, and they, they deserved to win, but I just, I was disappointed with the outcome, to say the least. Yeah. I, I was I was rooting for a little bit of North Carolina, uh, a couple of Iowa kids on there. You know, I just, I, I wanted North Carolina to win, but no. To answer the question, I had no idea that Villanova and North Carolina would be the top two teams at the end of the season. Yeah, and you know, Villanova, they basically showed us the whole tournament that they were at that level, and just nobody seemed to believe them that they could get to the national championship, but then once they got there, ended up winning that game, one of the best national championship games I've ever seen. Where does it stack up for you guys? I mean, yeah, I had people or friends around me immediately talking about the Christian Leitner game, and just sure. the fact that that's the first buzzer beater to win it all we've seen in over 30 years. Uh, ever since NC State, so just something like that was just absolutely incredible. It was. Uh, I'll give it a B plus more because I'm a little bit <laughs> mad about the North Carolina, but I mean, it, it, of, the, of our time right now, absolutely. I mean, we we never got to witness the Christian Leitner uh, buzzer beater, but to see a buzzer beater in the final game yeah, of the, the season, NC State it, just back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, just just the amazing amount of play and how talented this. Uh, Villanova team was was something special, and it's probably something we won't get to see for another yeah. couple yeah. of years. And not just the buzzer beater, but the shot right before by Marcus Page, yeah. where mm -hmm. he double clutches in air, and that might not be remembered mm -hmm. unless you're a North Carolina fan. Mm -hmm. And that was an unreal shot by Marcus. It Page. was, it was, and really the only thing, the only game you could even think about comparing it to would probably be the Memphis Kansas game a couple years back. I know we were talking. To, on the Clone Zone, that's Tuesdays from 7 to 9 on 88.5 KURE. But we were talking about how this game stacks up. That's really the only game in recent memory that you could compare to this one. That one was a little different dynamic. You had Derrick Rose against Mario Chalmers. Obviously, that one went into overtime, so even a little extra time to enjoy. But I think this game takes the cake. Just like you said, uh, the last two minutes, I mean, even though Nova came out victorious, they kind of escaped with that because they were, what were they leading like uh, 10 to 15 yeah. points with about eight minutes left they blew that lead then you let that huge shot by Marcus Page go in to uh, take that and then go down there and finally make your shot with Jenkins it was absolutely an incredible game um, any last thoughts on that game before we go to attorney as a whole uh, just what you said about the Memphis Kansas game I'm a little biased because I'm a Derrick Rose fan, so that one obviously I wouldn't like as much. But, yeah, going – I mean, North Carolina, they had 14 offensive rebounds. Villanova only had two. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned North Carolina kind of battling back. But Nova was able to just shoot so well. Phil Booth had 20 points. So you really just got to give your hat off to Villanova for really shocking the world and pulling off a, a kind of a big upset, even though they were a two seed. Sure, sure. All right, so now looking at the tournament as a whole, uh, I wanted you guys to grade this tournament. So – if you could grade this tournament, we'll start off with you, Michael. What grade would you give it? Uh, I'm going to be pretty optimistic here. I'll give it an A-. Okay. You know, we were able to watch Iowa State win a couple of rounds. Obviously, mm -hmm. the Virginia game didn't go how we wanted. We saw Syracuse, a 10 seed, get all the way to the Final Four. I think that was pretty exciting for a lot of people. And at the, at the end of the day, we saw the Northern Iowa game. We saw a lot of big buzzer beaters, and I think Marge lived up to the expectation. Sure. Matt, what do you think? I don't think you guys are going to like mine, but I gave it a B minus. B minus? Uh, okay. I mean, I, I liked... I like throughout the tournament that the one, the one seeds kind of dominated, but there was, there was just a thing throughout, like like we had talked about on the weekend pregame from three to five on, on Fridays, Fridays on KU Sports, Sports there you go. Uh, that, I mean, it, it just seemed like the first round spoiled us as yeah. 
I mean, it That's was saying, it was yeah. too good, mm-hmm. uh, too good and of a round. It is too good of a round. Yeah, and then it just kind of ruins everything afterwards. That and I mean, up until the championship game, nothing really really stuck out in my Couple mind. Games in there. I mean, yeah. a few, but I mean. That's just kind of how it went, but I think I think there there could be a more exciting tournament uh, with less amount of upsets. But that's what people want to see. That's not what I personally want to see, but I people like it, so yeah, sure. I'm a little bit different on that. Sure, uh, you can throw out my grade as well. You know, I thought very similar. Those first kind of rounds did spoil the second round. Uh, the second round, or not necessarily the second round, but the Sweet 16 was kind of down. It wasn't as exciting. I gave it an A- minus overall because I think it came back. There's uh, some really uh, good games in the Elite Eight and into uh, the Final Four. Only one of those games was really interesting. The other one, <laughs> uh, you know, from time and time again, Oklahoma just kind of blew that one. But uh, I thought that final game really gave it an extra boost. I, w- I probably would have put it in the B range if it wasn't for that national championship. Just blew it out of the water. One of the best you'll ever see. Will be remembered long after we're all gone. But uh, so overall, I gave it an A minus. Okay, so already as we always do here on KURE Sports, we like to predict things. We like to look to the future. Uh, and considering the season just ended. We don't have much information, but we do have some. So I wanted you guys to tell me who's your team to beat next year. We'll start off with you, Matt. I'm going to go with Duke. Okay. Uh, Fear the Blue, as it will say on my graphic here in a second. (laughs) Uh, I think with the number one and number two overall uh, overall recruits, thank you, recruits coming in, I just – and just it's a reload. I mean, you can't can't not look at Duke and say with Coach K – with top two recruits that they're not going to be in the top. I guarantee a final four. I would guarantee. I would guarantee. Final there four. it is. Yeah. Look at that. Man. Look at that man. Like he's one of the greatest coaches of all time with, and he didn't even have, he had a top 10 class, but he didn't have the top two recruits this year. You're going to sit here. Absolutely. And guarantee a final Absolutely. Four. They will be in the final four next Mark year. Mark it down. Matt Barker. That's a hot take. If Very hot take. One. Michael, who are some of your teams to watch? I would go with Duke, but you just took them. Also, yeah. mention really quick, Grayson Allen is coming back for his junior season, he so is. that should be big for them. Uh, I'll go with the other team in blue that I, pretty much everybody would predict, and that's yeah. Kentucky. You said the number one and two for Duke, but just the amount of top 100 recruits, this is according to ESPN, that Kentucky has. They have the number three, seven, eight, 15, 27. Those are five top 30 guys right there. It's tough to And beat. you know that Calipari is going to get them, he's going to get them rolling throughout the season, so... I've got Kentucky maybe a little bit over Duke just with the way that they're able to reload on freshmen. Yeah, I think it's going to be another one of those years where definitely those teams, more than you saw this year with the young guns, can kind of get back to the top. Uh, I'm going to go with the surprise pick because I know I knew, I guessed, somebody was going to go with Kentucky, somebody was going to go to Duke. That's what everybody's leading their list with. But I'm going to go with somebody from the pack. That's right, the Pac-12. I'm going with the Oregon Your Ducks. Your love for the Pac is just <laughs> uh, too the, much. I just, I, it's probably true. It's probably true. But Oregon, they showed themselves <laughs> in this tournament. They only had three seniors on that team. Uh, so I think that they will be able to reload, especially in the Pac-12, knowing it is down. They should come out with a pretty good record at the end of the season. Uh, be able maybe spot a, a one again would be incredible for Oregon, but maybe a two or a three seed in the tourney, I think they could probably make some noise again, maybe get to another Elite Eight or maybe a Final Four. So a definitely another team to beat going into next season. Okay, cons- talking about next season, uh, there have been those two early top 25s, and then, of course, the last top 25 of the season following the national championship. Michael, you had a note about Iowa State in that top 25. Yeah, and the note was one that a lot of Iowa State fans are kind of upset about. I believe it was not just through CBS, but ESPN, that the Cyclones were left out of the 2016-2017 top 25. And, I mean, it's understandable the absence of Niang, McKay, and Abdel Nader, all of our seniors, will definitely hurt, especially in the front court. But if Monte Morris does come back, you still have... Hallis Cook hopefully getting better, Deontay Burton, Monte Morris, and then Naz Long coming back from his redshirt injury season. It's a lot season. of guards. So it it's is a lot, lot of guards, guards, but at the same mm-hmm. time, I feel it's a lot of experience, and I'm hoping that they can really battle for at least around the 20 to 25 range, although okay. obviously myself and everybody's expectations will be lowered. Do you think they fall out if, they, if Monte Morris leaves? 
I do think they fall. They have no the reason to be in the top twenty-five. I agree. Yeah. 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 That's, I, that's, yeah. Then that's that's why I'm gonna I'm gonna say I think they should be left off. Uh, yeah. Because as, as of right now, it it looks like more Monte should leave if he. I if don't he, think he will though. I, I see that's really? that's something up for debate. I don't think so. But I mean, we're just gonna go off of the what I mean what the outline says with top twenty-five. I think he's gonna leave, and I think he they don't deserve to be. Well, in the let's top talk 25. about it. let's talk about it. You think he's gonna leave? What? I do. Yeah, what? I think it's his best chance right now. I mean, yeah, you, I have, agree. I agree. you have after a Sweet 16, uh, getting to the Sweet 16 as a team, I think now would be the best chance. Uh, we talked about it before, again, on the weekend pregame, that uh, possibility of injury we've always talked about with uh, Marcus Lattimore and just, just another year, like stuff like that happens to, to great athletes. Mm -hmm. uh, the Jadavian Clowney uh, taking, what, three or four games off. Uh, South Carolina, it, so it's not it's not na or it's not uncommon for for uh, college athletes to be scared to move forward before they get injured at the co sure. college level, where sure. they're not making any money at all. And you think he's going to stay, Mike? I why? think he's going to stay, stay, and I have two major reasons why. The first one is next year, there's no more George Niang. He's going to be the go-to guy. So yeah, they might not make it to the Sweet 16, but he's going to have a chance to boost his stats and also try and show that he can be a leader. A point guard, which what he, which is what he is, as well as another kind of small weird reason. On Instagram, he posted decisions, decisions, decisions. And if you were going to leave, I don't know why you'd really post that because everyone's just gonna be saying like, oh, come back, come back. So I just felt that was kind of weird. He's in social media plan. now. Okay. Hey, they love nice, it. You know the nice. Cyclones Dis love it. Disregarding the social media, <laughs> that's totally credible here. But uh, I just think. If he gets enough word from the scouts when he is in the combine and, you know, uh, looking over the draft and considering his, his options this year, because you can do that this year, changes the game. Uh, I think if he gets enough word that he will be going, you know, early to mid-second round, there's no reason he shouldn't. And I think it's too big of a risk to come back. Sure, you, you might be the guy, but is he made to be the guy? He's a facilitator. I don't think he's he supposed to be He could get the either. ball to George Niang, and George could do what he wanted with it. You know, he had offensive prowess at times, Monte did, but I don't think he was really – I don't think that's his best place in this Cyclone team. So I think it would be a tough decision if he did decide to go that route. All right, that's all we've got here for NCAA Men's Basketball Talk on KURE Sports on ISU TV. These guys are staying as well as myself. We'll be back with NBA. Stay tuned. But the only girl that could talk to him just couldn't swim. Tell me what's worse than this. And the echoes in the halls, they dance along the walls. The memories of your goals. You were the one that I used to love, and I'm still in love, and I never loved you the most. I've seen better. Everything you had, every little thing you had, I feel love on repairs. I seen your best words and not your words, you're still the best, but that my best, I am the worst. It's a curse, your eyes are lined in pain. Black tears don't hide in red, and I tied you to the tracks. When I turned around, I heard the sound, I hit the ground, I know there's no turning back. I've seen better days Celebrate in my youth I can't breathe my flesh Believe the truth Better days Celebrate in my youth I can't breathe my flesh Believe the truth Back on KURE Sports on ISU TV, Taylor Manko along with Matt Barker and Michael Mainzer. Thank you all for tuning in today. Another show under our belts, episode five. This is time for NBA once again. And once again, as is the case with most of these shows and 
basically all of our radio shows, we have to talk about the Golden State Warriors. Uh, you know, they lost again. Again. It makes it even more interesting to talk about. Since we last met, I guess they've lost twice they have. here on air. Uh, lost to the Celtics at home and then just lost to the Timberwolves. Also at home. The, the mighty Timberwolves <laughs> of Minnesota. So this brings up an even bigger question because they now have to go undefeated to beat the Bulls' record. Should they go for the record? Michael. I personally definitely think they should, although at this point, having you undefeated, playing the Spurs twice and the yeah. Grizzlies twice, it's going to be difficult. But if you look down the road, you probably can't tell me off the top of your head who won the championship six or 11 years ago. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. But you definitely remember who the 72 win team is. That's and true. obviously they should be going for the championship. But at the same time, this record is a big deal. And yeah, you're always supposed to play for championships. The Spurs rest their players, stuff like that. But the Warriors, if I'm Steve Kerr, and like the players, they definitely, in the back of their heads, or in the front of them, they want that record. So, I mean, if they lose one more game, then they have all the rights to rest. But they're going to be playing the Spurs and going to play them in the playoffs. I say go for it completely. Mm -hmm. Matt? I'm going to say yeah, but I'm, I'm worried because I did catch an interview uh, from Jerry Mondrine saying that they are, they're not worn out, but they're, they were bored with hearing about this every single time. Sure. Uh, and I think that's just kind of the mental drain of the, the mental and the physical drain of the season uh, and of just chasing this record. I mean, yeah, not, people have it's been not, talking about it all I year, mean, and yeah. it's not just like one thing. Like normally they just talk, oh, we want to get a championship. We want to get a championship. Now they're, now they're asking two great feats out of this team. And it, it could be mentally draining. I, I don't know because I'm not on that team. But I mean, it, it, I would assume it's mentally draining and it's physically draining. Yeah. I could have uh, sworn you were on that team. I <laughs> wish I would be. I mean, hey. Drain and threes that, on the daily. Oh, Matt Barker. Next Clay Thompson. Matt, the Hurricane Barker. Oh. Well, you'd shoot a thousand threes a day, you never know. That'd yeah. be fun. <laughs> <laughs> keep going, keep going, though. Uh, let me stop you. I just, I think, to answer that, important. how important is it to be compared to the championship? I think they should just win the championship, but I think they should try for both. And if it, if it happens, like you said, Michael, if they do lose, rest. Uh, don't play another. Don't let Steph play another game. Who cares? Let 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 them have the first. Or let uh, you're gonna have the first seed. Who cares? It, it doesn't matter anymore after that. Just rest. Yeah, you know, uh, I think they should probably go for it because I think they have the depth to do so. At this point, they're they're a very deep team. Uh, granted, you got the Draymond Green, Stephen Curry, and Clay Thompson. They get they get the press, but they are a really deep team. So I think that it wouldn't hurt them so much to be going for it in these last four games. Granted, two of them are against the second-best team in the NBA, in the Spurs. To be determined if the Spurs are going to be playing their players or not, that's always up in the air with Coach Pop. But I think they should go after the record. Uh, but I wanted to ask you guys a follow-up question to this. How big would uh, the storm be? after the Golden State Warriors, if they get the record, they successfully get the record in these next four games, but then they get knocked out in the first round. In the first oh, round? Boy. Or by, like, the Spurs? Anybody. I guess, I guess we can go anybody. Uh, that that's big. a fir first round? That's, that's huge. Then that's, that's probably uh, Steve Kerr's problem on that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, think, I think that's a huge problem. Uh, I think he's going to be definitely going to be having to answer a lot of hard questions. Uh, from reporters and possibly his boss. Uh, I, I mean, they're, like you said, we've, they, want, they want to win championships. Sure. And I, I think records should come second to championships. Mm -hmm. But if, if, they do, if they do beat the record and they get bounced in the first round, then so be it. Then so, they, they so pitch wrong, in my the, opinion. Let me alter the question. Let's say they get knocked out at all because they've been so dominant all year. It, would a championship... Like, let's say get, they get to the finals and get knocked off by whoever it is over in the East, the Cavs. Cavs. Probably the Cavs, the <laughs> Raptors, the Hawks, whoever it is. Whoever Don't throw your finals. Raptors in there. I'll throw the Hawks in there as well. <laughs> I'll, give the, I'll throw the Celtics in there. Eh, no. 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 Not what? the Celtics. They just beat the Warriors. Yeah, so. One game. So. And it's best seven. <laughs> good. Uh, but regardless, let's say they lose in the finals after they clinch this record. Will there be any finger pointing towards them going for the record if they lose in the finals? There will be finger pointing. I mean, you're going to look at social media and tons of people are going to blast them. But at the end of the day, I think that the Warriors themselves will know that that was 
if they're in the finals and they lose, that it was a long time ago when they were going for the record, and I don't think it would end up making a difference. Yeah, they might have been a little more fatigued, but they just played 82 games plus however many it's going to take to get to the finals. Mm -hmm. So you can blame it on that, and people will blame it on that, but I don't think that's what's going to be the actual factor. Sure, sure. I think probably the biggest factor to blaming the going for the record would be if they lost in the Western Conference Finals to a Spurs team that is known for resting their players, not going for the record or anything. Because potentially if they would have gone for it, they could have potentially gone for the record as well. They've been resting players since about the All-Star break, the Spurs, as basically every year. So I think that's when the biggest uh, hurricane would drop down on them over uh, – in San Fran would be if they lost to the Spurs, a team who was known to rest their players, and they successfully looked more fresh in that series, stuff like that. But regardless, let's go to that matchup. We've got two of them left here, the Spurs against the Warriors in this season. Let's take a little, little preview of this game. Michael, start us off uh, with a little preview of uh, the Spurs Warriors. Well, the game tonight at 9.30, if you want to watch it, it's mm -hmm. at Golden State, yep. and Tony Parker, for some reason it's Tony Parker, was the one reporting that they will probably be playing their starters. I don't expect that for the second game because it's so much closer to the end of the season, and Popovich, like you said, mm -hmm. usually likes to rest the starters. But I'm going to pick the dubs, I think, at home. With the amount of stuff that's been going on, they also just lost two of three at home. Yeah. I think that Steph and them are all going to have a big game, but it's definitely going to be close. That is it. Popovich is playing his starters because we saw the last time they played each other, Steph missed like, I think it was 10 threes, I think it was one out of 11, and Popovich's defense was able, the Spurs defense, was able to really get under the Warriors' skin, but I'm going to go with the Warriors' win, but it should be a good game. Parker, who, would you, who are you taking in this first of two matchups, the one in Golden State? I'm, I'm going to just go Warriors, but just because of home, or home court. Uh, I think, I mean, it's one of the, obviously it's one of the loudest uh, one of the loudest arenas in the NBA at this point. Uh, it's going to be packed. Everyone, everyone who's an NBA fan is going to be watching. So this is going to be probably the next two games between these two teams are probably going to be probably one of the most watched games of the Regular, NBA season. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say the Warriors, and I'm going to say as well, it's going to be close. But I think I, I just think home court advantage, especially to the Warriors, it, it means too much. And I think that the Warriors are just going to sweep by maybe like five points coming down to free throws. And technically speaking, if the Warriors were to lose both these games to the Spurs and somehow drop one to the Grizzlies, the Spurs could actually take the one seed. Mm -hmm. That's true. Not that that is very likely. Not likely, but possible, <laughs> considering how they've been playing recently, losing to the Celtics and the, the Timberwolves. Uh, for this game, this first of two games, I'm, I'm really tossing it up in the air. Sure. Uh, the Tony Parker did uh, mention that they might play in. I don't know if he said how much they would play in that. You so never know. You never know with Popovich and the Spurs. So I think that the Warriors are going to take this one easily. I think that the Spurs are probably going to play their big guys for, who knows, like 10, 15 minutes out of this game, uh, realize that it's not worth it, and then sit them down for the rest of the game. But I think that second game is a lot more intriguing being in San Antonio. Uh, they've now got the record for longest uh, streak at home and whatnot. So I think you've got to look out more for that game. But I've got the Warriors winning tonight at home pretty, pretty decently, probably 10 points plus. Now let's move over to that second game against the Spurs. Michael, who do you have in that game? I mean, it's kind of just saying the Spurs are going to win that one because home court sounds kind of cliche. But yeah. I'll take the Spurs in that one, although there's still a lot we have to find out. We have to find out, did the Warriors still go undefeated? Sure. Are they going for the record? Because yeah. in that case, I'd probably go Warriors, but I, I don't know. Just it, it depends on a couple factors. But overall, the fact that we might be able to see nine more of these games, these two, and then if it were to go to seven, if they were to play each other in the West Conference Finals, I think it's just pretty amazing as an NBA fan. I mean, there, isn't, there hasn't been a team in 10 years that I've gone in my, and watched on uh, watch TNT when they're playing against the Timberwolves, but these Warriors are just that good. <laughs> and uh, so both these games I'll definitely be watching as an avid fan, but I'll go with the Spurs for the second one just for the sake of home court. Okay, okay. Barker? I'm going to say the Warriors <laughs> because I think if, if they – if the San Antonio Spurs, like you said, there's a lot. There's a lot. If they there's beat, a lot of ifs. Yeah, if they beat 
the the Warriors at home tonight, I think the Warriors will come back and play hard to try and ruin their streak. Mm-hmm. I think it'll See. be I think it'll be two ways of trying to ruin streaks. So if you can't have it, if we can't does have Popovich ours, does Popovich really care about these things? Popovich doesn't, but I wonder if the Warriors do. The Warriors definitely yeah, exactly. The Warriors so definitely do. that's why. So if if they if they lose tonight, and the Warriors go back to San Antonio, which I think they'll I think they'll play everyone, and I think they'll try and try and break their the Spurs streak. And I'll say that, I'll say the Warriors at the Spurs. So even if in your scenario, if uh, what you were saying is that the Spurs could take tonight's game, mm-hmm. which would Scrub the record Correct. for the Warriors. Yep. Although they could tie it, which they I don't could know if they tie can. It. Forget tying. They we, no to, one wants but, tying. Uh, it might happen, too. Yeah. It might, but the record would be scrubbed. They could not get the record anymore. You think instead of resting players, they would go out for revenge? I would. I'd be a little upset. I mean, you played, you played <laughs> almost 82 games, and you're that close in the Spurs. Yeah. And the, the number one team that you I think of when resting That's what players, Popovich wants them The to number do. one team yeah, that you think of when resting, and they don't rest their players tonight. If they did that, I am almost 100% sure that they would go in there mad as hell and whatnot. Popovich would sit every one of his players. And let them win. And let them win. That's fine. So then they wouldn't have to play. Let them play. <laughs> let them beat them. Who cares? Sean what? Livingston, 30 Sean points. Sean Livingston, 30 points. Let them have it. All right, last note here in the NBA section. Coach of the Year predictions. Start off with you, Barker. Who's your Coach of the Year? Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr. Not Steve Kerr. Oh, I thought you said Steve Kerr. Okay, then who is it? Luke Williams. Who? Luke Luke Williams. Walton. Luke Walton. Luke Walton. I'm sorry. You should have played that off like you meant that. I should have, too. I said Lou Williams at first. (laughs) He's right there. (laughs) There he is. There he is. 39-4. I know he can't. I just I want to throw it in there for more of a, a comic. Is there there. actually a rule that he can't? I don't know. I mean, he's zero. He's technically zero and zero. Technically, yeah. I mean, so I don't know. But didn't he get uh, coach of the month? Yeah, he got coach of the month. So I mean, so I I would like to. I mean, that's the next head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers, right there. I would hope so. Former player. That's fine with me. That's (laughs) completely fine with me. See you, Byron. He's gonna go into a mess. I it can't get any worse. It cannot get any worse. That's probably. It could be the Sixers. True. Yeah. yeah, who knows how this draft yeah. go, Draft is going to go. They could become the next Sixers. I just gotta hope not. stockpiling big men that don't do anything and break feet and whatnot, <laughs> just bring them all in. <laughs> all right, so who's your coach of the year prediction? Uh, you didn't give him too much love earlier, but I'm going to go with Brad Stevens of the Boston Celtics. Yeah. He's taken a team that has some talent and made them look like a team with a lot of talent. I mean, you have like Jay Crowder, Isaiah Thomas is all of a sudden an all-star, Kelly Olynyk, guys like that. And I feel like Brad Stevens is one of those guys where you watch them play and he's constantly on them and they just have that mindset where they really want to win. It's kind of like a different but similar Thibodeau Bulls where there's guys that are trying really hard and you don't always see that with other teams. Mm -hmm. And as a result of it, the Celtics are a rising team in the East right below those Raptors and Cavs, which are more talented teams. So, I mean, Steve Kerr, Greg Popovich are up there, but I don't see another reason to give it to them besides the fact that their teams are so amazing. Like, they're not doing anything out of the ordinary. Yeah, and yeah I feel it's like Brad, same, Brad yeah. Stevens is kind of a new guy that a lot of people like, so I could see him winning it. I'm going with a, a different new guy, if you will. I'm not going to go with the Popovich or the Kerr here because they, like you said, they're doing the same kind of thing. I'm going to go, uh, granted it is my team, but I really think he deserves it if you hear me <laughs> out. Dwayne Casey, I mean, I'll, he, I'll listen. he is probably the third person in line here. You Obviously, 52 <laughs> and 25. He's came over from the Mavericks, what was it, four years ago. Uh, he's really a defensive mind, but he's turned, he's cri- around. He, he's yes. turned Toronto around. I mean, team chemistry-wise, you look at teams, the Raptors are near the top, and that's mm-hmm. a huge thing, especially you look at the Cavs over in the East. That's only one of the things you can go back at and say, you guys may not be ready because of your team chemistry. You see LeBron having a couple problems. K-Love is still trying to mesh into there. Kyrie Irving's had his problems and whatnot. I think Dwayne Casey has really created quite a culture over in Toronto, which is very hard for a technically international team to do in the Raptors. I think he has done a very good job uh, this year. First 50-win team in franchise history over in Toronto. I think he should make a good case. And you mentioned the Cavs. Really quick, since they hired Tyron Liu, they've actually lost more games. Yeah. I think it's by two or three than when they had David Blatt. So I don't Good know call. why they had Tyron <laughs> Liu, but I feel like it was 
part of the reason they wanted just LeBron to like LeBron. not be the head coach, but to be like the head coach. Be, yeah, so coach. Yeah. LeBron. Yeah, good job, guys. Well done. Well done, Cavs. They'll still probably Cleveland. the finals. We'll see. We'll see. All right, that's all we've got for NBA. We're <laughs> going to take a break here on KUR Sports on ISU TV. Stay tuned for more. You got two black eyes from loving too hard and a black car that matches your blackest soul. I wouldn't change it. Oh, wouldn't ever try to make you leave. No. Oh, the neon coast was your sign and the Midwest wind and Pisces rising wouldn't change it. Oh, wouldn't ever try to make you leave. No. on KURE Sports on ISU TV. I'm Taylor Menkel. Welcomed with two new guests. We've got Alex Crowell to my right, Michael Morrell here to my left. Time to talk a little MLB. The season started. It did. Yeah. We're pretty excited. We seem excited. So instead of talking about the now, we're going to talk about the future as we always do here on KURE Sports. Uh, we asked the question, Alex posed the question, who's going to be your MVPs, your Cy Youngs, and your Rookies of the Year? It's a lot to a lot to cover here, but let's get into it. I'll start off, uh, pull up my graphic here to show you who I've got for first off the MVP race. Uh, I'm gonna go with Mike Trout. Even on a bad team, off to a really bad start to the year, Trout in particular has not done well at all. But he is my uh, MVP this year. Just edged out last year by Donaldson, but. Uh, not the right graphic, but regardless, uh, <laughs> we'll get to that later. He's my MVP over on that side. Who do you have uh, for your AL MVP, Crowd? For my AL, I, I like Trout, but yeah. like you'd said, I think the the year thing, the year that the Angels are going to have, I, yeah, I think that, that affects it. That'll be it. tough. That'll be tough. I, I don't necessarily like the narrative that your team has to do well. It almost could, to a certain extent, help you if you're that your much better than your yeah, you're having that and you're and year. you're able to get your team mm -hmm. to another level. But I just don't think it's enough. It, Don Donaldson edged him out last year. I don't think that's, and I think it'll be similar this year. Sure. I think I like Carlos Correa. I think yeah. it's neck and neck, and I think Michael likes him as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just think he, he's unbelievable. He, he can do it all. He's a five-tool player. He's got the power at a position that you don't need to have it at, at shortstop. Mm -hmm. People are saying he's could be the next Alex Rodriguez. Statistically, he's not quite there yet in all the categories. But I think that with my thoughts on the Astros this year are they're a World Series contender. And so I think he's the best player on that team, and he'll be able to get it done. Yeah. I, like, I like him this year as my MVP. Then just go over to the NL for you. Right, and then over to the NL, uh, my lovely make baseball fun yep. again, Bryce Harper, uh, little graphic there. Uh, it's his to, to give away. It I is. mean, he had one of, the mo one of the greatest statistical seasons in the history of baseball last year. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, he had another home run on opening day already. He's just he's the face of what baseball should be here to come, and mm -hmm. I think he's – He's done an unbelievable job, and he should be a great ambassador for the sport moving forward. Sure. No one plays harder than him. Uh, it's his to give away in the NL. All right, so your MVPs, Michael. Yeah. 
So for MVP out of the NL, I got Paul Goldschmidt. I think he has the potential yep, to have a really underrated. great year. Mm, and okay. people kind of look past him a lot. And he's been the one bright spot of a Dimebacks that have really been struggling for a couple years. And I, I think he's just going to have just carry that team to a playoffs. I really think that they have a potential playoff type team. Um, and then out of the AL, I also like Carlos Correa. I, I think he is, has the potential to be the best player in baseball this year. He's just, he's just truly incredible of an athlete. You know, he, I think he already has what, three home I runs said, already, yeah. mm -hmm. a couple stolen bases. Like, he's a 40-40 guy. Mm -hmm. he, you, you can just see it. So th those are my AL MVPs. Yeah, yeah no, I, really special. I, I think he has the opportunity to be such a special player. I mean, five-tool players don't come around very often, sure. and I think sure. he really could be that. The a -Rod, I think Pedro Martinez, I saw him tweet that Correa has the ability to be an A-Rod type of player. Not, I don't know that he can get there statistically. I mean, he doesn't need to. I mean, he's already been so good in, in a lot of other categories. But I, I think... With how good the Astros are going to be this year, I think that's a really good pick. Yeah, that does help when your team is really good. So let's jump over to the Cy Young race. Uh, go ahead and start us off, Crow. Who you got for your Cy Young? I have an interesting Cy Young. I wanted to go away from uh, a repeat in, on the AL side. Dallas Keuchel, I think he still has a nice year. Yeah. Um, and there's some other obvious ones. Uh, David Price is a pretty popular pick. Marcus Stroman's a pretty popular pick. I'm going with Cole Hamels of the Rangers. That is a bold uh, pick. Bold pick, very bold pick. Had a great start, uh, seven strike or eight strikeouts in seven innings yesterday or on, on opening day. Got the win. Since getting traded over to the Rangers, he's eight and one. So the team's getting yeah. it done for him. He's he's performed well in his new home uh, at the ballpark of Arlington, and I think just I think he'll get there. It's a veteran. It's a team with a lot of veterans on it. A, a really solid team. They're they're going to be a playoff contender, and I think. His arm with that team will be able to get it done. Sure. Um, and then over the other side, I do have a popular pick, uh, a chalk pick, if you will. Yeah, I have Kershaw. Yeah. He's just not to. He'll, he needs to step it up this year for that, for that organization. They don't have Grinky behind him. They have a lot of injuries um, with that starting rotation. They have, they have some issues there, um, and even in the lineup. But they've done well so far. Yeah. Um, but he, Kershaw knows, I think, he, he needs to get to another level this year, um, which is crazy for him to have yeah, to do that, absolutely. but I, I think he has the year to get the Cy Young. Yeah, for my Cy Youngs, I wanted to go Kershaw on the NL. I knew uh, more than likely one of you would, so I decided to change it up a little. I just went with the repeat there. I think it's a safe pick that he'll be in the conversation, Jake Arrieta. Started out pretty well, as you see there, uh, throwing in my other MVP that I forgot to mention, Bryce Harper. kind of went chalk on both of those guys, but uh, Arietta, I think, He's just got the stuff, and he's got the confidence that you need. But over on the AL, I've got a little surprise. I've got Kluber. Kluber okay, from, yeah. from Cleveland. Granted, it's another player that has to fight against a bad team to show what he's worth. And it's going to be hard to get those Ws, but I think his stuff is going to be there. That, uh, that is uh, going to be enough to at least put him in the conversation. Michael, who are your Cy Youngs? So my Cy Youngs, on the NL, I went a little more of a surprise and someone that people might not be thinking of. Max Scherzer, he kind of didn't have yeah. the best year last year, but he still, is a, you know, he still is a great pitcher, and I think he has the potential to take a Nationals team that I think is going to have a good year this year. Mm. You know, that, there was just some chemistry issues last year, and that's not going to be a problem under uh, Dusty Baker. Um, uh, but I just think he's going to have a good year. And on the AL, I kind of went more chalk. I went Max, uh, I went, uh, sorry, Marcus Stroman. I think he's... Mm. I just think he's ready to just take over that rotation with David Price leaving. He's the he's the ace now, and I I think he's gonna come out and have ace okay. type numbers. Just think he was five eight. He's five eight. No, I did not know he was. Five Most eight. starting pitchers aren't five eight. No, he's that's, that's it's short starting pitcher. Yeah, he'll definitely have the support to be able to do it. I mean, I don't know. He's there. he's been down, he was four zero to end this year last year coming off Tommy John. Mm -hmm. uh, he showed his stuff in the playoffs. I think he's he really has an opportunity to go get it with the help he has with their lineup. All right, we're gonna jump to. Who came out hot? Who came out not? We'll start off with hot. Who started the team hot? We can go teams or players here. We'll start off with you, Michael. Who's hot? All right. For a team, I went the Dodgers. They had probably yeah. the best uh, start of the season Ooh. of anybody. They started out They started uh, with three wins against the Padres. They outscored them 25-0. to zero. They didn't allow a single run in 27 innings. That's incredible. You know, Dodgers are just playing really good baseball right now. The starting rotation was really surprised. I'll get to that a little later. But um, Robinson Cano had also had a had a great start. Four home runs already, three games in. You know, people the narrative of Robinson Cano having a good year is definitely 
got off to a good start. My stud pick from. It was your stud pick from, from the draft. Pick. So tell us uh, who's hot right now, Crow. Yeah, so Puig's hot for the Dodgers. So yes, to, to come off of what uh, you know Michael was saying there, he's a guy that's going to need to help out. You know their lineup. A guy that had a down year last year. He's dealt with a lot of off-field issues, but I think this year he's going to need to have his head forward and. I don't know if he sustains it necessarily, but he's had a great start for sure. Mm -hmm. And then the Cubs. Cubs With all the expectations yeah. that that team has this year, they needed to come out and have a hot start, and they played against a pretty solid team in the Angels. Not the best team in the world, but still a solid team with sure. good arms. Sure. Um, and, and they came out 2-0, and, and yeah. that's that's something that... They're impressive 2-0, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's more to speak, if the Cubs would have gone 0-2, there would have been some panic, I feel like. Probably. Rega probably regardless, probably. it's a 162-game season, but... It's a lot better to, to talk about 2-0 than it is 0-2. Comes a little nerves. Comes a little of the hype. But uh, for my hot teams, I went with a little both years. I went Dodgers slash Cubs. So there you go. We've got that. And then my hot player right now is Trevor Story. Uh, yeah. Four home runs already. Seven RBIs. Obviously, the average isn't there. But, man, he's crushing the ball for the Rockets right now. Let's go to came out not. It was not hot. We'll start off with you, Crow. The Diamondbacks 1-2 did not come out very well. Uh, Zach Greinke might have had a little bit of a flu bug. We're not sure what's going on there, but he had gave up. Excuses. Yeah, a little bit you of excuses give it there. For my fantasy team. Come I think on, so freaky. too. Uh, yeah, not the best. <laughs> Six earned runs in one inning. I think it was either the fourth or the fifth for him. Didn't have a long start. He only gave up 41 runs all year long last year. So some issues there. And Shelby Miller didn't have a great start either. So they're going to need to get it together. But the Padres, like you had talked yeah. about earlier, having some issues there, got dominated by the Dodgers. Who's not? All right, for me, I have my Cardinals there. They had a rough start, 0-3 against uh, the Pirates. They let a game get away in game two, and they just did not have a good – they struck out 37 times in a three-game series. You just sure. can't do that. That's too many strikeouts. Granted, it was against a really good team. Good it team. was. It was. The Pirates are a good team. They're going to be good this year. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then I actually have the, uh, the Cubs two through seven hitters. A lot of times what comes with the hype is the extra scrutiny, and if you really look at what they did those three games, while they did score runs, their two through seven hitters went five for 40. You know that that was out out, and that was just not a good start if you don't count Zobris. Five for forty. So, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. I think it might speak more towards they're able to win not having everybody hit. Because, yeah. I mean, you only need a handful of guys to hit on certain days to be able to get wins. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I guess I can see it. If they bring them around, yeah. I mean, when you drop in, what is it? What's their av What they score last Nine night? nothing. And Nine then last night, I don't know the, what they had. Like, I can't remember. Regardless, it was pretty it was, handily. It was above six, I believe. So, yeah, they're getting them around, but okay, I, I can see that two through seven hitters need to perform a little better. Mm -hmm. um, uh, who was not for me? Let's start off with Zach Grinky, as yeah. you mentioned. Obviously, not a good start there in your first start for the Diamondbacks, and then I have the Padres as well, basically piggybacking on you, Crow. Now let's go to our surprises. Uh, who or what team has been a surprise thus far for you? Start off with you, Michael. Mine was the Dodgers, but more specifically the Dodgers starting pitching. Okay. The Dodgers starting pitching was something that was really kind of outside of Kershaw. People were like kind of a little unsure of coming this year. There was a little bit of a depth issue. People weren't really sure of what they had. And then they came out and responded with, in three games, pitching 19 innings, giving up zero earns, 18 strikeouts. You know, they just had a great run. And actually the Dodgers pitchers actually scored two runs mm -hmm. and they allowed zero. So the Dodgers pitchers are outscoring, outscoring teams on their own right now. So they had a really good start. I think it's hard to say a surprise team so far, but my surprise performer of the season is David Ortiz. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, still, I mean, he's hitting four for the Red Sox, still one of the greatest clutch hitters of all time, but I don't think I expected him to come on the scene and already have a couple home runs. Yeah. He was robbed of another. He's really just had a great start to the season, and, and that's good. Will he keep it up? Maybe not to this expectation or to this quality, but uh, he'll have a good year, and I'm, I'm happy as a Red Sox fan to see that he'll go out hopefully with good statistics in his final season. I actually had your hot player crowd for my surprise. Yasiel Puig uh, had a lot of scrutiny in this offseason, but he's been very good to start the season. And then I had the Rockies, the Rockies offense in particular. The offense has mm -hmm. been there thus far for the Rockies. Granted, as a team as a whole, you need to get a couple things worked out, but the offense for the Rockies has been there thus far. Now, uh, last note, favorite players of the season thus far. Start with you, Crow. Mine's Gregor Polanco of the Pirates. Just signed a new contract with that team. He's their third tier, um, the right fielder for that organization. I think that's the best outfield in baseball. And so to be able to go ahead and sign a young guy, a, a top prospect for that organization for a longer period of time, uh, will be really good uh, for them in the NL Central. And he's had a hot start to the season, which is always something you're looking to 
um, especially when you sign a new contract, that the guy is going to continue to perform. And it looks like he's going to have a pretty solid year for them. I'm, I'm excited to watch him play. I've got some pretty big bats for mine. I've got Anthony Rizzo of the Cubs. I like where his leadership's at currently. And then I've got Bryce Harper. He's just so fun to watch Yeah, all the time. One of the best, if not the best, probably the best player in MLB. Obviously a great player to watch every year. Michael? Yeah, mine, I, I kind of have two players uh, from the same team, Carlos Correa and Jose Altuve. That mm. is the best middle infield yep. in baseball. You no can't argue it. You got Altuve is the great average guy, and then Correa is just an all-around player. And I think that, that those two are just going to carry Astros, the Astros all year. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Alex. That's all we have time for here. For our MLB segment, we'll be back with soccer or football, if you will, right after this. I'm taking over my body, back in control, no more shoddy. I bet a lot of me was lost, T's and crossing eyes and dotted. I thought it a lot, and it seems a lot like flesh is all I got. The Sports on ISU TV. Two new people here, Laurel Feeks and Andre Safar. Join me, Taylor Menkel, for a little football. That's right, football. Football. I'm football. glad I like, I like to say football. 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 Right. <laughs> Let's start off with the Champions League. The Champions League started back up again. It did. We had uh, an interesting encounter, on uh, encounters rather, Tuesday and Wednesday. We had Barcelona versus Atletico Madrid. Um, Turned out to be an interesting tale. Well, first and foremost, they had the El Clasico versus Real Madrid um, in, on the weekend, and Real Madrid beat them. Shock result. Uh, well, I guess it's not too shocking just because they're rivals, but they, what's shocking is they snapped their 39-match mm. unbeaten streak at Barcelona mm -hmm. um, on the night they were paying tribute to Johan Cruyff, all that. And then, you know, um, Lapp and Pique scored, Benzema then equalized, and then Sergio Ramos got sent off. And so... Sergio Ramos, I tell you what, man, that guy with all his defensive prowess, um, his discipline record is just as <laughs> interesting, you could say. He has he just most red cards for for Real Madrid ever, hmm. in because he got a red card in this game. Uh, most red cards for um, for uh, the league, and then uh, four in El Clasico. I can't believe this stuff. That's a lot. It is, but yeah, he's, uh, I think it's like 21, 22, and like, uh, as far as uh, cards, and yeah, he's like 30, yeah, Ramos. Anyway, uh, he got the winner, uh, I'll preview, you know, Atletico, they beat Betis 5-1 mm -hmm. at the weekend, and so to today's action, uh, and we had the graphic up, it is the story of two former Liverpool strikers, right there you have Fernando Torres and Luis Suarez, Torres of course here for Atletico and Suarez for Barcelona, um, <laughs> I was talking to someone that I, um, in class today about uh, Torres' performance, he did score a goal early, uh, early in the first half, and then he got a red card just, you know, um, not too long after. 
Uh, that kind of sums up his career, is what we were talking about. <laughs> you did so well, and then you kind of went down. He's a hothead, too. Yeah. Nice. He's a hothead. Mm. But, he, but he scored. It's a, it's a good away goal. Uh, but then Suarez, of course, as we had, he scored twice in the second half. Makes it 2-1. So they got to go to um, Atletico and play at about uh, next week, I think. I believe next week. Mm-hmm. And so we'll see what happens there. Great match, though. Mm-hmm. Now, what shocked me was yesterday, it was Wolfsburg and Real Madrid. And you'd think coming off the El Clasico uh, win against Barcelona, yeah, yeah. headstrong, man, got the mm-hmm. momentum. But that's not exactly what happened. Not at all. And I'm, I'm sitting here like, this really happened? Uh, shock result. They pulled off an upset. And I don't want to say, okay, okay, I guess I should say, I don't want to put anything against Wolfsburg to take anything away from their credentials. They're a good team. Mm-hmm. They're a good team. But shocking, they, they defeated Madrid 2-0. Yeah. Um, goals from Ricardo Rodriguez and Max Arnold. And then Marcelo. I think he's the one that comes to mind um, in this game because he was also, you know, this is going to be a show about hotheads. About he was hot-headed. also hot-headed. <laughs> and uh, he was doing a lot of play acting, a lot of diving, frustration, head-butting. I don't understand, I don't understand what he was doing. Ah, but I don't know. There might be some further repercussions for him mm. after that. Um, and if he does get a ban for the next match, that would kind of not. Kinda, they'd be losing one of the arguably the best left back in the world playing for your team. So um, not as interesting. Bayern Munich and, and Benfica is one 0 Bayern. That's fine. <laughs> They'll be fine. What was interesting yesterday was PSG and Man City. This is a hilarious match, in fact. Um, not one for people who want to watch good, you know, football because it was a comedy of errors. I tell you what, it was a big st- for all the money they spend in their clubs, and then to see that kind of stuff like defensive errors. I mean, the one thing that was nice is Joe Hart saved uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic penalty, um, and it ended up two two. But one article on ESPN FC was saying something like, "Oh, uh, after this result, these teams." are definitely miles behind uh, the, their European competition, which um, that might be true. That might be very true. But it was a good match, and they still have. Uh, you could say the advantage is with Manchester City because then they have to go to the Etihad next week. These away goals, I tell you what, there's something else. The aggregate, but they're worth they're they're gold, golden mm. goals, if you will. Yeah, I shouldn't say that. Golden goal is like, goals uh, like different. Winning, it's a different yeah. system, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you get it. You get it. Uh, Europa League, my my match of the day. Your match of the day. Match of the watching day. Watching it earlier. I was. I was Getting watching excited. class. Try not to yell. It was. It was. Uh, it was Borussia Dortmund Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know you're a, suddenly a Dortmund fan, as you I'm told me. I'm just a fan of everybody who plays Liverpool <laughs> on the day, right? <laughs> on on day, the day. Yeah. As you can see, one one. It turned out Jurgen Klopp there, former coach, former hero of Borussia Dortmund, if you will, now a hero. Uh, of Liverpool, at Liverpool rather, and you know it was, as expected, a positive reception for Jurgen Klopp when That's he returned. Good. They both sang um, the same, you'll never walk alone before the game. They, uh, Klopp promised if they scored he wouldn't celebrate and he didn't. Um, he was still the energetic guy that we know. And both stadiums, um, um, the, oh, what's it called? The <laughs> Westfeld Stadion or the Signal Iduna Park uh, Dortmund and Anfield, two of the most electrifying places uh, to play football in the world, arguably, and it was. I get goosebumps. I was just watching it backstage of the entrance. Just got goosebumps. Like these guys are pumped to play. But yep, uh, we had Origi. He scored. He opened the scoring in the first half. Hummels got the goal in the second half. What's surprising for me, and, and I'll break down Liverpool a little bit. Sacco and Lovren, the two center backs, you get a lot of cri- criticism mm-hmm. uh, this season for you know maybe inconsistencies. But they literally put their bodies on the line in this game. You can't say they didn't give it a shot. Mm-hmm. Uh, Henderson, however, uh, the captain, he went off with injury. That's kind of worrisome. He's kind of been here and there with injury. Um, and then at times, Dortmund were just really surviving a fury of attacks from Liverpool. I think you you were watching where maybe five, yeah, yeah. five, six times, shot, 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 you know. And maybe arguably they could have been two one up, but you know they're going to go to Anfield um, next week, second leg, crucial way goal for for the Reds. So. We'll see what happens. I'm excited as always, and yeah, yeah. You're always Champions excited. Champions League you're and European excited. football. Yeah, European you, that's, football. that's how it goes, man. So let's go to a different football now. 
The women's national team. We've Ooh. got resident expert Laurel Feeks. Resident, 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 resident expert. The resident expert. The resident expert. Laurel Feeks is what I. Laurel Feeks, if yeah. you will. Are we gonna bring that over to KURU Sports? It's gonna resonate it's with you for the rest of your life. It's everywhere now. <laughs> the rest uh, of your my, life. My new legal name. But the national team played Columbia just last night. They did, and they didn't just play them; they annihilated them. They annihilated them. <laughs> okay. Um. So they won seven, uh, seven to zero against Columbia. It was uh, Julie Johnson's 24th birthday yesterday, Woo. so she uh, left the game with an assist. Well, according to you guys, 24 is old, but I don't know. <laughs> you you're know. 35. Yeah, but you're 35. <laughs> you're you're 35. Oh, oh, you're right. You're right. I well, okay, sure, <laughs> sure it is. But um, you know, the the national team has uh, kind of gotten this rhythm where they start off slow for maybe the first 10 minutes, and then all of a sudden just clicks after the first, second, third goal sometimes, and then it, <laughs> and then the momentum is unstoppable, and as you can see, yeah. seven to zero. So uh, for me, the player of the match was Allie Long. She's hasn't been called up to camp and called up to the team a couple months, maybe a year, and uh, she scored her first international goal and then decided, hey, I'm going to score another international Why goal. not? Yeah, so uh, let's go for it. It's yeah. a sell do my brace. Right. So, sure, you maybe. Know, so uh, hopefully we see more of Ali Long and as she's trying to make her campaign for the road to Rio for right. the Olympics this it's summer. Coming up. Uh, Kristen Press, big Kristen Press fan, she got a great goal. Yeah. Uh, and then it was just kind of like, who wanted to score? Yeah. We got Tobin <laughs> Heath. Tobin Heath, notable player. Carly Lloyd scored. 17-year-old wonder kid, Mal Pugh. Uh, huh. She scored. 17 years old, she basically carries the whole team on her back. No kidding. Yeah. Mm. And also, I'd like to wow. point out, we didn't have Morgan Bryan on the team. Uh, they, didn't just starting Morgan. they didn't have Morgan. Morgan, Morgan Bryan, she midfielder. Um, yep. She had a hamstring uh, injury, so she was okay. off the roster. Uh, but Alex Morgan, we won the game without Alex Morgan. Who's Alex Morgan? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Alex Morgan. Alex I never Morgan. heard of. Hold up. We won a game Hold without up. Alex Morgan. We don't need Alex Morgan to win. Well, maybe that's oh. for me indicative of how. Oh, is um, it indicative? The depth. It is indicative. <laughs> it is indicative it of maybe the the depth maybe for uh, the United States. Oh, absolutely. They. Of I course. mean, it. Yeah, they're the world champions and the world champions for a reason. There's yes. there's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're insanely fit. They're one of the mm -hmm. fittest teams in the. You know. Mm -hmm. Or, um, and yet they're not getting paid as much. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah, let's. If if you have some thoughts on that, now's the time here. Uh, yeah, obviously lawsuit happening and whatnot. Yeah. You've got different people backing up the women's national team. Obviously, the the statistics are just horrifying. Oh, well. they're yeah, horrible. It's, it, the yeah. the NWSL bumped up. I can't remember the exact number. They bumped up their um, salary cap. I want to say by like ten grand. Wow. But okay. their salary cap Still, is doesn't even make their it salary doesn't, yeah. cap is like two hundred forty five thousand. So it's not even like a dent. <laughs> oh, we did a little bit, but that so doesn't. So it's, it's it's so sad because they bring in so much, so many. I mean, they bring in more fans. They bring in more money mm -hmm. than the men's team do. They're, well, they're way better. They are than exactly. The, than they're the way better. And when is. the women's were, uh, they won the World Cup. So I want to say they had to divide. Yeah. Two, was it two million between all twenty three players? See, and the, they won the World Cup. That's ridiculous. The men's team just going there. Just and, going there, and yeah. they won. Oh my gosh, how they much money a, did a, they? A substantial it amount. Was a, I can't yeah. remember yeah, the exact number, but I do remember two million for the women's did. national team, and they won the World Cup. And I understand they're two different. You know, there's a lot more investment in the men's, but it should still be. Uh, well invested with the women's, they're still working just as hard. Mm -hmm. It's a, just a different maybe style of play, but it's still competitive it's and it's still it's still professional. And, yeah. and they're successful. They're very they're bringing in girls all. It's a very popular sport. Women's soccer, uh, football. Sorry, football. Oh, <laughs> and, oh, I just committed like this. <laughs> but it's very popular in this country. And I don't it's it's shielding maybe away from a lot of things. Well, and I showed you this tweet last night, but I saw a funny tweet. Um, you know, it was like, if you want to ruffle some feathers, go stand uh, with a post that says one nation, one wage next to a one nation, one team sign and see and see what happens. <laughs> That'll <laughs> ruffle some feathers. That'll get some I really, I liked that there. tweet. That one was funny. Yeah. But, the yeah. Men, and especially now, and I should say this, the men's team and how they're doing, they, you know, arguably, mm, well, now they look a little better, but they were n not going to make it to the Copa uh, yeah. America. And they're not, they're not playing very well. And so I think that's that's sad. Yeah, like it you is. said. It is. Well, and I also read, I saw something. It was like, you know, we need to be investing more in our uh, American soccer programs. And I'm like, no, and you need to be investing in the yeah. men's team. And yeah. Abby Wambach brought up how um, 
we need to start be pulling like to pull from American talent. You know, we have Jermaine yes. Jones and we have all these guys who were born mm -hmm. on military it, it, bases. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, There's a lot. You had, but uh, they won like, it. But yeah. m the women's team. They're all homegrown. Exactly. I think with men's <laughs> with men's football too, that's so indicative yeah. of <laughs> of what football like France is that way. Uh, Germany is the same way. A lot, yeah. But I agree. You should start, you know, building from what Spain is a huge example because yeah. they right. have a huge um, system within the youth programs and build up. They uh, they're all from Spain. They're right. all like mm -hmm. Spanish born. You know. You know, technically, and that's kind of born from success over time. Yes, teams are so successful in a country, then you have these little kids growing up. I want to be just like this yes. person. They were born in my country. I want to be this person when I mm -hmm. grow up. And I think that shows how successful the U.S. Women's National Team mm -hmm. has been over the years, over about the uh, twenty-year span here, and how successful these new upcoming uh, talents are. Right for the national team. Right. The recognition. And that's exactly like Sydney LaRue, she's half, uh, she's Canadian American. Mm -hmm. um, oh no. But she, uh, well, and the, the Canadians <laughs> are a little, kidding. the Canadians are a little butthurt about it, but you know, she came here, oh, gosh, when she was like 14 or 16, because she wanted to play right. for mm -hmm. right. and that's, the United yeah, States. Yeah, that is kind and, of huge. And you know, of course Canada is super talented, but mm -hmm. you know, when you leave your home country to so come and- What does that say? Yeah, you know, absolutely. what does that say? It says a lot. So, yeah. Just need to get She's the probably the one exception for homegrown, but you sure. Know, but there. with the majority, but, but yes. For the majority, yeah. everybody, and also with you know, as you said, with the young talent, you know, we're bringing up players like Mal, um, mm -hmm. 17 years old. There's like two or three more that are kind of like sneaking their way into sure. camp. Yeah, um, build way haven't played yet, but you know, we're starting them younger and younger, and should. There you and go. they're all looking up to players like nine-year-old players, of Alex Morgan Maroon. and Hope Solo. So right. If go. we can continue. And they keep that winning trend. World Cups. They just, yeah, get the... Three stars, man. Let's three get stars. Them. Put it on, baby. Let's, let's keep going. <laughs> you all hear it right here on ISU TV, on KU, or KUR <laughs> Sports on ISU Yeah, TV. you know. Yeah, they're both they intertwine now. You know, it's five episodes. You don't today. know where you are. <laughs> you don't where know where you are. are. <laughs> all right. Andrea Safar, Laurel Feeks, thank you for this football segment. We'd like to thank Alex Crow, Michael Morell, Michael Mainzer, and Matt Barker as well for coming on the show. And for all our crew, I'm Taylor Nichols signing off. 4KUR Sports on ISU-TV.